Professor Kim. Yeah. Well, let me say it is an honor to be here. Can people hear me now at least? I can hear myself. <laughs> um, I don't feel up to the task. I, I, I warn people about this. Uh, I've taken a small section of this magnificent large book, and uh, I, I don't think I can do it justice. So I apologize, John, Ronnie, and I, I hope, look forward to learning. In any case, Dworkin, I believe, there, before everything I, you, uh, you read here, uh, or I, I read here, there's always the I believe, Dworkin argues that ethics is based on dignity, which involves first the requirement that one think of oneself and one's life as objectively and intrinsically important, and second, the special responsibility that one has to oneself to live well. This responsibility involves seeking to live a good life, understood as pursuing success according to one's independently formed goals, but within moral constraints. Dworkin emphasizes that one can live well even if one's life is not a success. So if the only route to success in all one's goals involves corruption, one's, one lives well in not being corrupt, he says, though one doesn't have success. And the ethical responsibility to make success of one's life is not mere preference for oneself, as was emphasized. This is a duty. He argues that these two ethical principles, which I shall refer to as importance and responsibility, can help us to derive the content of and the motivation to pursue morality, which involves obligations to others. First, one cannot correctly believe that one has importance unless others do too, as it is only in virtue of properties one shares with others that one has importance. I think that's one part of his argument. Second, if one has a special responsibility for one's own life going well, this will be true of every other person, and this will affect what is morally expected of each person. Now, one of Dworkin's aims is to show that our importance implies duties to aid other persons. But despite everyone's having equal importance, we are not required to show as much concern for others as for ourselves. He argues that we owe aid only when not giving it shows disrespect for human life. And this does not occur if we refuse to aid when it would involve either neglecting responsibility to ourselves or interfering with responsibility others have for themselves. Yet Dworkin also says that it could be noble, saintly, or generous to give up one's success to save others from disaster, though it does not show disrespect for them not to do so. And while he says that, quote, one must not aim to make their lives more successful overall, because it is their responsibility to choose goals that they can manage. First he says, you may not, and then he says, indeed, one must not. This seems inconsistent, I think, this latter quote, with his claim that it would be generous for him to give up a trip that he's won on behalf of someone who could not otherwise manage to fulfill a lifelong dream to take such a trip. Furthermore, it seems that those who act nobly will still have fulfilled their responsibility to live well, even if they give up success, not because it conflicts with moral constraints, which he accepts is a reason to give up success, pursuit of success, but because it conflicts with a supererogatory act. If this is so, then other people who do not act nobly, supererogatorily, but choose instead to make successes of their lives, cannot claim, contrary, I believe, to what Dworkin says, that it would have been wrong of them to aid when they would sacrifice their success because they would have neglected their responsibility to themselves or their chosen goals. Now, if this is what I've been claiming is true, it still need not imply, I believe, that there really is no responsibility to make something good of one's life. In earlier work, I've argued that it is not true that one must always fulfill a responsibility, for example, to give a presentation, rather than do a supererogatory act, such as risk one's own life to save a drowning person. We can agree with Dworkin that we have a responsibility to make something good of our lives, so long as we think that we really should be doing this, when we have not chosen to do something else important. The second uh, of Dworkin's aims is to show that ethical responsibility explains why we may not harm people in certain ways. 
First, he thinks responsibility grounds rights to one's body and some property, because without these, one could not make a success of one's life. My sense is that ethical responsibility is not necessary for deriving such rights, because even if one had no responsibility, as Dworkin describes it, one would have a right to one's body or property acquired in certain ways, I believe. I can't give the argument for that here. Indeed, it seems dangerous to make such rights contingent on responsibilities, ethical responsibility, for it is clear, if it is clear that someone has no intention of fulfilling his responsibilities and therefore has no need for his body or property for this purpose, he may lose these rights. I also think that having responsibilities is not sufficient for showing that one has a right to what one needs to fulfill one's responsibilities and so may not be adequate to showing one has a right to one's body even. Dworkin makes two additional claims with respect to harm. First, what accounts for the impermissibility of deliberate harm, deliberate harm, is its usurping a person's responsibility, not just his right, to decide what is a good use of his life. For in deliberate harm, we act because we have decided there is something good about someone else being harmed. By contrast, he says, when an agent causes harm that is not deliberate, the victim has the bad luck to be in harm's way. But the agent does not decide that the harm to the victim is good, contrary to the victim's own decision. Dworkin's additional claim is that this distinction between harms coincides with the distinction that the doctrine of double effect draws between intending harm as a means or end, which is not permissible, according to the doctrine, and causing harm, and causing harm merely foreseen. The latter can be permissible, according to the doctrine, when the foreseen harms are side effects of bringing about a greater good by innocent means. Now, my first concern about these two claims is that both the doctrine of double effect and Dworkin ignore that it is often wrong to cause lesser harm as a side effect in pursuing a greater good, though it's not deliberate harm. For example, Dworkin discusses the trolley problem. I've been waiting years for that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in his discussion of the trolley problem, finally we're going to get an answer, right? Uh, in his discussion of the trolley problem, Dworkin does not note that it would be morally wrong to set a bomb that will redirect a trolley from killing five people when we foresee that the bomb will kill a bystander as a side effect, merely as a side effect. Here, the fact that we do not judge a lesser harm to be in any way good does not make causing it permissible, even for the greater good. My second concern is that sometimes it is permissible to do something bad to someone based on our judgment that it would be good if this occurs, contrary to the decision of the person himself. This is true, I believe, in the loop version of the trolley that Dworkin also discusses, in which, in this case, we may redirect the trolley from the five only because one person on a sidetrack will be hit thus stopping the tro trolley from looping back around and killing the five. I think that it is permissible to act in that case. Dworkin agrees, but I do think it is a case where we act because we think harm to that person is being hit is a good, instrumentally. One reason Dworkin worries about the loop case, and he does worry about it, is that he thinks that our acting on the judgment that the person being hit is good involves our intending the hit. However, I do not believe this is correct. I've argued elsewhere that I think that redirecting the trolley because we will bring about the hit is not the same as redirecting it intending to bring about the hit. Now, some, ed some evidence for this is that being willing to turn the trolley from the five only because this causes the one to be hit and stop the trolley need not imply a commitment on the part of the turner to do anything even easy in addition, extra, in order to see to it that the hit occurs. Indeed, I've argued that turning the trolley only because the hit will occur is consistent with helping the one person off the track if this became possible, even though the five will then die. Intending the hit, however, I do not think is consistent with such help. If what I've just argued is correct, then redirecting the trolley in the loop case need not violate the doctrine of double effect. 
though redirecting still runs afoul of the distinction Dworkin wants to draw between harms based on whether causing them involves, as he says, usurping someone's responsibility for deciding what is a good use of his life. If this is correct, then it shows that contrary to what Dworkin is claiming, his distinction between harms does not overlap with that of the doctrine of double effect. Thank you.